This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one website platform to succeed online. Today we will be taking the class of tryptamines under the loop, specifically tryptamine itself and a tryptoline derivative, with some pretty quirky experimental applications. This compound belongs to the class of small molecules called beta-carbolines, specifically a tetrahydro-beta-carboline, where the two double bonds have become saturated. To better understand the general picture, let's first zoom out and look at the structural backbone that the carboline structure bears. This backbone is the essential structure in a lot of natural compounds that are used to ward off predators in endocrine systems as messenger hormones and as quintessential medications. Tryptamines are found in almost all plants, animals and fungi. Substituted tryptamines often have pharmacological importance, mimicking endogenous tryptamine compounds used in biological processes which keep you alive. A very good example of this mechanism is the famous NN dimethylated tryptamine, called DMT, mimicking serotonin. Serotonin, also called 5-HT, after its chemical name 5-hydroxytryptamine, binds to the 5-HT receptors to express its action. Due to its modification, DMT has a much higher affinity for the receptors than serotonin. It is even able to display serotonin, and it fits way better in the receptor, which causes a stronger signal, resulting in the effects felt when using DMT. Mimicking endogenous compounds is the mechanism behind a lot of medications. In this case, by agonizing the receptor this way, we get hallucinations and enlightening effects, if you will. Which brings us to the next topic, beta-carbolines. Beta-carbolines are basically cyclized tryptamines, and they occur commonly in nature. For example, the harmala alkaloids present in Syrian rue, which are also brightly luminescent. Some animals, like the scorpion, harness the luminescence as a sort of sunscreen that absorbs UV radiation from the sun and re-emits it as harmless visible light, in turn making them glow under UV. Synthetically, we can make such beta-carbolines with the pictet spengler reaction, which we will learn more about later. Further, the pharmacological effects of beta-carbolines are dependent on their substituents. Most of the naturally occurring beta-carbolines often interact with the central nervous system, acting as a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, preventing the breakdown of dopamine and serotonin type molecules. This can be a real hazard, especially with the co-ingestion of other medications or certain foods. Getting a waterfall of blood out of your nose when you bend over is not uncommon when having eaten large amounts of cheese, containing tyramine whilst using a monoamine oxidase inhibitor type medication, which you can imagine is very dangerous. With the clandestine synthesis of dimethyltryptamines, it sometimes happens that the reduction with sodium borohydride catalyzes the formation of a beta-carboline. Luckily, pinoline and tryptoline are not that good in inhibiting monoamine oxidase. Otherwise, a lot of hospitalizations would occur from homemade DMT. However, some beta-carboline derivatives are shown to be broad in biological activity, being an antioxidant, possessing anti-tumor effects, or even being useful as an antibiotic. This makes the beta-carboline structure a nice basis for new research, aiming to seek new, more selective medications to treat illnesses. The beta-carboline derivative that I will be making today has no effect on mood, cognition, or reward. Rather, it has been investigated as a base structure for antiparasitic activity towards certain types of diseases such as malaria. At the moment, however, it is still experimental, and more research is needed, though it will just serve as an example since the synthesis of this class of compounds pretty much always uses the same reaction. This compound is this 4-methoxyphenyl tryptoline, which can be made from tryptamine and P-anisaldehyde. So the synthesis starts with the decarboxylation of the common amino acid L-tryptophan to get the tryptamine, and then I can use that to make the tryptoline. But before we get into that, I would like to thank Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Squarespace is an all-in-one website platform for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online, which I've been using to start setting up and building my own website and store, because soon I will have Isolin and some other products for sale on my website. What I really enjoyed when starting out was that there were many flexible templates that are also just really nice from itself, so I only needed to customize them a little bit to fit my needs, and I quickly got what I needed, which saved me a lot of time. Besides that, their Fluid Engine design system allows you to be extra creative in building what you need, as well as extensions that allow you to use many third-party tools to extend the functionality of your website. So go to squarespace.com to try it out for free. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So to get started, I set up a flask in a heating block and add in 150 ml of acetophenone, which will act as a solvent and a catalyst. Into that, I add 20 grams of L-tryptophan powder from a supplement store. I then attach a spiral condenser and heat the block to 240C, 
As it heats, the reaction starts, and the mixture turns orange. It starts to bubble from escaping carbon dioxide, and makes snappling bubbly sounds that are very satisfying. I then leave this to react for about 4 hours. In this reaction, we decarboxylate L-tryptophan, which will give the imine of tryptamine and acetophenone, which after workup is converted to give free base tryptamine. How it likely proceeds is first through protonation of the acetophenone by the carboxylic acid. The amine can then attack this protonated ketone, giving this intermediate that undergoes a proton transfer to give this amino alcohol. Then, it is converted to an imine either by protonation and deprotonation by another tryptophan molecule or intramolecularly, after which the protonated hydroxyl is kicked off as water, giving this imine. Under strong heating, this product can be decarboxylated, where the carboxylic acid is split off as carbon dioxide, and the imine double bond is saturated by the remaining proton, while a new imine is formed on the other side of the nitrogen. In the following molecule, we have an imine, and some imines can scoot over to the other side, through bond delocalization and insertion of a proton, which is what we need to happen for it to make sense. So let's just assume it does, giving the imine of tryptamine and acetophenone. During the workup, we add acetone as a solvent, but it can potentially swap with acetophenone to form the amine of tryptamine and acetone. When it is treated with benzoic acid, we form the benzoate salt of the corresponding aminium, which can precipitate from the acetone. We can then collect this and treat it with aqueous sodium hydroxide to give acetone and free base tryptamine. After a few hours, the reaction is red, and it should be finished. So I take it off heat and let it cool down a bit, and then set it up for short path vacuum distillation to remove all of the excess acetophenone. When that's done, a red liquid is left behind that should be the amine of tryptamine and acetophenone. To this, I add 150 ml of acetone, which could swap with the acetophenone and form a more reactive amine, and at the same time have a solvent in which the next product is not so soluble. So for the next step, I first move all of the solution to a larger flask. And to that, I add a solution of 12 grams of benzoic acid and 100 ml of acetone, with which I also wash out the smaller flask. This should form the benzoate salt of the aminium. Since no water is added yet, it shouldn't form the tryptamine salt. I then move it to the freezer to crystallize out the benzoate salt, but not so much as crystallized after sitting for a while. So I instead force it all out by distilling off the acetone, and then adding a little bit of the acetone back in. I swirl it around to get off all the solid, and then set it in the fridge to cool down. When it's cold, I set it up for vacuum filtration to collect all of the solid. I wash that with a bunch of acetone, giving the benzoate salt of the aminium as an off-white solid. The weight of this turned out to be 19.1 grams, and now we can convert it to the tryptamine free base. So I first add some water, and then an excess of a sodium hydroxide solution. I heat it to near boiling until an oil forms, and no more solid is floating. I set this mixture up for filtration to some cotton to remove the oily layer, which is crap. And immediately the mixture is already cloudy from crystallizing tryptamine. I then move the filter to the fridge to cool down, and when that's done, more has crystallized out. So I set it up for filtration to collect it. I wash it with a little bit of water, and we see that the amount was actually quite deceiving, and it was just some fluffy crystals. I move it to a crystallizing dish, and the yield turned out to be only 3 grams of slightly wet tryptamine. That is a terrible yield of 19% which is sad, but expected, since this chemistry can be quite inconsistent. Either way, it should be good enough to make a tryptaline derivative, and I will just make one with P and its aldehyde. For that, I set up a flask in a heating block, and add in 2.1 grams of tryptamine. Then as a catalyst, 1 gram of L-tartaric acid, and as the aldehyde and second reagent, I add in 1.52 mL of P and its aldehyde. Then I add some water to dilute it, and 1.1 mL of concentrated hydrochloric acid. Since the literature starts with tryptamine hydrochloride, I will just add one equivalent of hydrochloric acid to make it the same. And finally, I dilute it with 45 mL of water. In the literature, they say they just let it stand. That's a little weird. So I will just add a stir bar and let it stir for a day at 60 C. This is a typical pictet Spengler reaction, where a beta aryl ethylamine undergoes condensation with an aldehyde or ketone, followed by ring closure. In this case, using tryptamine and p aldehyde to give the formethoxyphenol derivative of tryptaline. How it works is first by protonation of the aldehyde, making it more electrophilic and allowing for easy nucleophilic attack by the amine. When the amine is deprotonated and the alcohol is protonated, the free electron pair from the amine can form an aminium and kick off water. This aminium can then be attacked intramolecularly by the indole double bond, and the aminium double bond moves back onto the nitrogen to balance its charge. 
while a free electron pair from the indole nitrogen moves to form a double bond to make up for it, resulting in this spiral intermediate. This can undergo ring expansion, when the indole is attacked and the double bond electrons move back onto the nitrogen. We are then left with this intermediate that contains a carbocation, which can be fixed by deprotonation of the opposing carbon, of which the bond electrons move to form a double bond, in the end giving this form a thoxyphenyl triptylene derivative. When I return the next day, the mixture has become purple and some product has crystallized out. I then cool it down in the fridge to make sure all of it has crystallized and afterwards set it up for filtration to collect the solid. I wash that once with water and then once with ether. I move all of the collected solid to this dish and the yield turned out to be 0.9 grams of the triptyline product, which is 22%. I didn't run it for the full duration, so maybe if it was left longer, the yield would be higher, but it's okay. So this is how triptylines can be made which have a great variety of applications. That was it. See ya.